Good morning, everyone. May the Lord bless you as you listen to this message because He loves you very much. My name is Doug Sloan, and today I'll be presenting this short message titled, Satan Steals, Kills, and Destroys, But Jesus Gives Life. So before we get started, let's read our key verse for today that comes from John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus describes the actions of Satan versus himself, saying, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. There's a lot of useful information in this text, but most people simply read through the verse with little or no thought to the deeper meaning of these words. So today I'd like us to examine this key verse to better understand Satan's goal to harm the saints and to see how Jesus is here to protect us and give us an abundant life. But before we get started in this important discussion, I'd like to share a little humor with you. Since today's message has to do with a thief, I found a joke titled, Jesus is Watching You, and it goes like this. A burglar got into a home one night, shining his flashlight on the floor in the dark. He heard a voice saying, Jesus is watching you. He looked around nervously, shook his head, and kept looking for valuables. He again heard, Jesus is watching you. This time he shone his light all over and it rested on a parrot. He asked, did you say that? The parrot admitted that he had. I'm just trying to warn you, that's all. <laughs> the burglar said, warn me? Who are you? What's your name? Moses. <laughs> well, what kind of stupid people would name a parrot Moses? The bird answered, I don't know. I guess the same kind of folks that would name their Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> okay, that was cute. In this story, the thief was trying to steal things from the house. But Jesus, the Rottweiler, was right there to protect it. The same holds true for us today. When Satan tries to steal, kill, and destroy, the Lord Jesus is right there to save us too. Okay. Let's get started with today's message. As people of faith, we know that Satan's plans will ultimately fail. However, this doesn't stop him from trying. He uses every trick he can in order to derail our faith in God. In this message, we'll look at Satan's commitment to steal, kill, and destroy. First off, we'll see how Satan steals and what that means. When I think of stealing, the first thing that comes to my mind is how predator animals stalk and attack their prey. Let me explain. When I was a little boy in the 50s and 60s, I watched TV that only had three stations. Every Sunday evening, I watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Each week, Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler explained the wonders of our natural world and animal behavior. They often showed this type of survival in the Serengeti of Africa. Cheetahs stalking and killing gazelles, lions killing wildebeest, and hyenas killing antelopes. My heart was broken each time I saw this coming, knowing the young or weak animals would soon die. They were unaware of the danger, and as unfair as it sounds, this was always explained as the circle of life. Satan works in this way too. Like the predators hunting the young, weak, and sick, Satan looks for spiritually weak and the young people to take away from the church. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter draws on this analogy saying, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. During Peter's time, lions in the region of Israel were very dangerous as they constantly stalked the farms and rural areas. These predators often hunted sheep and cattle, which the farmers needed for food and fur. With these attacks, the lives of not only the farmers, but the lives of neighboring people were put at risk. Satan not only steals young and weak Christians, but he looks for anyone that he can overtake. 
Seeing how Satan purposely steals away the young and the weak, this also affects the faith and trust of others who remain. We must first acknowledge how Satan targets these young believers, and knowing this, we will be better prepared to protect our faith. In addition to stealing, let's examine how Satan kills. Just as we have seen in the last point, how predators steal their prey, now the predators kill what they have caught to eat. In the same way, Satan's ultimate goal is to kill the faith of seekers and weak believers. As their spiritual strength and faith in the Lord is new and fragile, Satan would like nothing more than to kill their desire to search and learn more about Christ. He actually wants to stop their faith before they come to salvation, since Satan cannot have them after that. So how does he do this? Well, by twisting the truth, omitting consequences, and planting doubts. There are many stories written in the Bible showing Satan's use of half-truths and omissions of consequences. He uses faulty human logic and pride to get people to do what he wants, as seen in Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, where Satan deceives Eve into eating the forbidden fruit, which says, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. While eating the forbidden fruit opened the eyes of man to good and evil, it also opened their eyes to the allure of sin that leads to death. In this illustration, Satan cleverly uses all three of his tricks in one sentence. He twisted the word of God, omitted the potential punishment, and planted seeds of doubt which caused them to defy God. While Satan's use of these three tactics, as small as they are, were effective enough to get Adam and Eve kicked out of the Garden of Eden and introduce the sinful nature to all mankind. We must follow closely to God's teaching and trust in Him in order to persevere in the faith. In addition to Satan's stealing and killing, Jesus tells us that Satan comes to destroy. So what does that mean? And what does that even look like? Well, let's start this discussion with the concept of Satan destroying the credibility of committed Christians. This is one of Satan's most useful tools. Satan cannot take away salvation from born-again Christians. However, he can easily ruin the reputation of even strong believers, rendering them unfruitful or unfit for the kingdom of God. He uses many different ways to do this. For example, we often hear of faithful pastors or other Christian leaders who fall into temptation and have extramarital affairs in the church. While they hold a position of leadership over their congregation, this doesn't mean that they are impervious to temptation and sin. While the church must apply appropriate punishment, we must also remember that they are just as sinful as everyone else. The reason I say this is that men of God are not perfect, as they're often viewed. They're all susceptible to the schemes of Satan who constantly tries to derail their ministries. When these sins happen and the truth is revealed, the integrity of all Christian leaders is often questioned. While God can forgive these transgressions, the leaders and the congregation will never forget what happened. The disgraced leaders typically stop ministering for the Lord. In essence, Satan has ruined their witness through temptation. Unfortunately, many members of the congregation will leave the church on account of the minister's sinful behavior instead of finding a new church community. This is very sad. Satan actually kills two birds with one stone. First, the church leaders, and then the weak Christians who walk away from the church. Satan also destroys the faith of non-believers and Christians alike in other ways, such as doubting the goodness of God. Satan sows the thought that if God is good, then why are there horrible things happening in the world? This is a difficult question. 
Throughout the entire Bible, we see unspeakable horrors, wars, famines, disease, natural disasters, and senseless taking of human life. It's hard to understand how God could allow these things to take place, but we must understand that we live in a fallen world as a consequence of man's sin and disobedience towards God. For now, we struggle with these horrible events, but know this, God is good, and he will not allow this to continue forever. A time is coming when Jesus will rule and reign over the earth for 1,000 years. After that, God promises to create a new heaven and a new earth with a whole new order of things. But until then, we will still struggle in the here and now. Finally, Satan diligently works to destroy the unity of the church. He stirs division which causes disruption among the people. Far too often, I've seen churches break apart over simple disagreements, from the choices of songs to the color of the carpet. These arguments are brought about by a spirit of discord through Satan. He pushes people's buttons and provokes people's pride and stubbornness to create division. This is seen in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, which reads, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. However, Jesus wants people to see Christians demonstrating their love for each other, as written in John chapter 13, verse 35, which says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Yes, we must hold on to the love for our neighbors and fellow believers so that Satan will not have a foothold within the church. Now that we've looked at the actions of Satan, let's turn our attention to the Lord. Remember, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So it all comes down to this. While Satan's goal is to destroy, Jesus' goal is to give life in the here and now and afterwards. So how does he do this? Well, here are a few ways. Jesus gave us life when he died on the cross. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus promises us that he is always with us, even in our times of need. Matthew 28, verse 20b tells us, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He also gives us the Holy Spirit who lives in us. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17 says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Finally, God's love for us is most clearly seen in John chapter 3, verse 16, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is probably the most well-known passage in the Bible, and it clearly gives us assurance of salvation and eternal life. Yes, when we place our faith in Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. Our names are written in the book of life, and when we die, we will live forever with the Lord. While this is a wonderful guarantee for the future, Jesus also gives us life in the here and now. So what does this mean? Well, through the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives within us after conversion, Jesus is with us throughout all life's difficulties. We are not alone. 
we can experience peace and joy in the midst of our problems, knowing Jesus will see us through. In essence, we experience new life through faith. Our old ways and our problems with it are gone, and we are completely changed. This is clearly seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Yes, in Christ we have a completely new life. In addition to the new life, Jesus helps us to renew our thinking. We no longer are filled with the desires of this world, the selfish wants of man, but rather the fulfillment of honoring and praising Jesus and his word. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 speak of the renewal of our minds by saying, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. As we renew our mind, our thoughts and actions will be transformed, which brings peace and a more abundant life. Now that we've examined all these issues, we need to think about spiritual applications. Satan's schemes to deceive people must be stopped, especially within the church. As Paul was ending his last missionary journey, he summoned the elders of Ephesus to warn them of pending attacks. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29, Paul says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Paul knew that Satan would infiltrate the church to deceive people and drag them away. And this still happens today. So if we learn of new people coming into our churches that are twisting the truth, teaching false doctrine, causing people to doubt God's goodness, or causing division, we need to tell church leaders, like deacons, elders, or even pastors, so they can stop them before our people get hurt. If we hear any teachings that seem a bit off, we must check the Word of God to see if the message is true or false. If we're not very familiar with the Bible, we should ask strong Christians for their opinions. Don't just believe everything you hear. Remember, the wolves are still out there. Finally, pray for understanding and protection. Jesus, the giver of life, hears all our prayers and he will protect us and guide us into all truth through the Holy Spirit. Now, to end this message, Let's review the key points we've learned so far. Today's message is very important because it describes the age-old conflict between good and evil. Our adversary, Satan, is determined to prevent people from coming to Christ, to kill the potential faith of those seeking the good news, and to destroy the reputation of godly men and women to stop their ministries. We must be aware of how Satan operates in order to avoid his schemes and to find solace and support in Jesus, who gives us life through faith. So let's enjoy this abundant new life and share the love of Jesus with those around us, so they also can come to know the Lord. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your unending love and grace. Your goodness never ends. Help us to understand the schemes of the devil so we can avoid his deceptions. We are so glad that Jesus came to give us abundant life, full of hope and joy. Be with us in the coming days and weeks as we strive to live and serve you. Guide us to those who need to know you and give us the words to help them draw near to you. As we minister before you, we will give you all the praise, glory, and honor, for you are worthy. We love you, Lord. Amen.